This, this theme is freedom and the blood of Jesus. If you would, to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. And as I always say, whatever book you're in, it's the best book in the Bible. Every, the Word of God is living, so when something's living, it's always good. You know, you ever go to dead places, there's a difference when something's alive. The Word of God, you can have a, you can have a move, of, move of God all by yourself in your house, you know. 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, uh, Cappadocia, and I can't see, I should look up there, Bith Bithynia, okay. Anyway, uh, according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied. Amen. Well, uh, Peter is preaching to the Gentiles, I mean t to the Jews, and Paul was sent to the Gentiles. Galatians 2, 7 said that, because see, this, when I read this, I thought this is pertinent to everybody. And I, one thing I know, the Word of God really is pertinent to everybody, but sometimes it's written to specifics in, in the Word. Galatians 2, 7 says, but, the, but on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed unto me. In other words, Paul was sent to the uncircumcised Gentiles. As the gospel of the circumcised was to Peter. Amen. Hallelujah. Only God could do that. You know, you think about that. He sent Peter to the educated and Paul to the people who didn't know anything. The, the guy with the intellect went to the people who were ignorant. And the guy who was ignorant went to the people with an intellect. I'll tell you, that is a stretch. You talk about a stretch on your brain if you're the one trying to communicate. I'll give them both credit. They both had to die. You know God makes you die so he can come through and not you, right? If you're comfortable with yourself and you're, what God's got you doing, you should probably check it out because you might be doing the wrong thing. Because when you're doing something for God, he, he takes you where your dependency is on him. or That way you won't shine through. Because we're not preaching us, we're preaching Christ, right? And Him crucified. Anyway, sanctification of the Spirit. A definition, I always get definitions. Listen, making or declaring something holy. That means that when you got born again, you were declared holy. But the making is the process that comes afterwards, okay? So you got to, the problem with that is you think you're not holy because God said so, but you don't feel it. But it's the same old thing. When God says something, he's beginning it. The seed, remember, unless you understand how a seed form, you don't understand the kingdom. First the blade, first this blade then the ear, then the full corn in the air. The kingdom of God works as if a man should cast seed in the ground. Even your sanctification had to start out as a seed. You were positionally put there, but it has to grow and be cultivated so you can have a holy character. How many of you weren't? No, you're not holy enough yet. There you go. I put them all. I can fall down if I lift that other leg because I know better than to think. Of, I don't believe in arrivals. I believe in journeys. Just to let you know, that takes a lot of heat off of you in case you're interested Instead of trying to achieve, you relax and you learn. When you try to achieve, you're performing and trying to make yourself happy and everybody else happy, so you never learn anything. But until you relax and know it's a journey, then you start to really learn. It's wonderful. It takes all the pressure off. I've got to, got to, got to, got to, got to. You know, you can't think when you're going, I've got to, got to, got to, got to. You can't. You've got to have time to think and, and think of, so God can talk to you. That's why if you're too busy, he can't talk. Anyway, so uh, he said some things there. Blessed be the Lord, you know, our God, and Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who which according to the abundant mercy has begotten us again. That means his original design was for us to be sons and daughters. Unto a living hope in the resurrection uh, of Christ from the dead. Now, positionally, Right? What's interesting, there's three things there. He, he said, uh, I'm going to declare something over you. I'm going to process you. Obedience in the sprinkling of blood. There's three things there. 
that have to take place. Uh, the position, you got it because he gave it to you. The process, he will put you through. Your job is to be obedient and to obey. And I know that sounds redundant, but we're going we're gonna to expand on it a little bit here. Uh, you have been brought up. This is what, how I felt when I got born again. How many of you got brought up to where it was clean and you realized how dirty you were? That's what the position does to you. When God puts you up here, you're like Peter. You say, Lord, I'm a sinful man. You know, you, you're, you know what you're not when you get up where it's right. So he puts you up there by position and cultivates an appetite for you to become that person. He puts you up where it's clean and your eyes are open. You will now see what you are not, so you will be open to what you will become. I always say, if, until you see what you're not, it's real hard to know you need something. You have to be, and I'm not getting you to dwell on your deficits, but you certainly have to be aware of who you really are so you can receive something that you need to make you what you're supposed to be. And that takes honesty with yourself. Brutal, I always say brutal honesty with yourself. Uh, Matthew 5, 1 and 2. Uh, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Until you can see your poverty, you probably can't see the next step. Uh, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, acknowledging your deficit is not the most comfortable thing in the world to do. But without it, you really don't get that part replaced with God. You keep what's there, and he can't get in because there's something on the throne until you let go of it. Uh, genuine conviction. Examples, I just gave it to you. Peter said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. You remember when he went fishing? And he realized what he was not. It was terrible. He just wanted to get Jesus out of there because it convicted him to be so bad. Being in his presence was terrible. Uh, Zacchaeus, he said, I'll pay everybody whatever I got to pay. I'll pay this in double. I mean, he got, got it. I mean, he got it. You can tell when, when God gets in there, you really don't like yourself and you don't like what you've done and you're willing to do anything you have to do to rectify it. And if you haven't gotten there, you're not squared up yet. Like if you did something and you need to go fix it for somebody, you got to just go do it whether, they, whether you believe you or not. They might even cuss at you when you go. I don't give a rip, everyone. It doesn't matter what they say. It matters, did you, did you tell everybody you're sorry after you did something wrong? It's got nothing to do with them. And if you don't, you you still got something you got to go take care of. Because you, you, you're just pretending it didn't happen, which means it's not exposed to the light, so it can't be cleaned up. Uh, there were, you know, Saul and Paul, obviously. Lord, what will you have me do? There are... Con there were conversions, a moment in time when your eyes were opened to see the holiness of God and your own depravity. I know that sounds really strong, but it is absolutely necessary for you to change. You have to get, you know, godly sorrow works repentance. If you're not sorry for, for the things you've done, I don't know about you, do you ever sit around and think of the stuff you did over your lifetime and think, man, I'm glad he's taking care of that because that's terrible. What I did is terrible. Now, when you were converted, you got the position. And he, he, this is what I think of. And it was, she talked about it here just now, prophetically, okay? When you were converted, you got your position. You became, what happened to you really is you became a son or a daughter. Now, we're, I was thinking during praise and worship, don't laugh at me. It's funny, she brought, I'm thinking the whole world's orphaned. I don't know anybody that had the perfect dad and mom. I just don't. And I can't find anybody, so I just, that doesn't exist. Okay? So, just like an orphan child who was adopted, you probably don't know and cannot appreciate it because you have no idea what you got. I, if you knew how many stories that you hear of people bringing people into their houses or adopting kids, and the kids are terrible and unappreciative and mean and all kind of stuff. You hear those stories all the time. It's because they don't know what they got. They can't, it's so painful to think that they can't even accept it, so they act bad all the time. It's because they have no idea what is theirs. 
And, and I noticed this in church. You know, the, the, if you stay in church long enough, you find out your own deficit's really good. You do. I mean, if you stay, you've got to stay to figure it out. First, you think everybody's wrong and you need to go find a new church. You've got to get over that. That doesn't work. It's not even in the system anywhere, okay? You, 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 you have to, you'll see people and you'll think, they don't appreciate that. Look what God's doing. They don't. Because every one of us seems to have been orphaned, which is what she just said. I actually believe we were all orphaned by Adam. He abdicated his responsibility and got us all killed, if the truth's known. He did. He gave it up, and we start dying. That's really what happened. So we've all been orphaned. So before you get too mad at your parents, just remember, they had to start where they started. You know, we all can tell horror stories probably about what we thought our upbringing was, you know. You've heard me talk about the nuns put me in a box and wouldn't let nobody look at me, all that stuff. You have to get over that stuff. It, you have to work your way through that. You, you understand, they, all this bad stuff that happens to you, you got to realize that you are in a fallen world, and it is, you were orphaned. Every one of us has probably been orphaned in one way or another. That's why God has to adopt you. And he's just said he's going to do some good things for you so you know it's him. Just a little while ago. I paraphrase it different than what you said it, but I heard what you said. So I think that, you know, we always think, why don't they know this and why don't they know that? I think it's because they've been orphaned and they've got to get their mind renewed that they're not orphans anymore. I think it, be, learning that you're not orphaned is the most important part of your Christianity that you'll ever have because, see, he wants you to be a son and a daughter more than he wants you to be a preacher, an accountant, a mom, a dad, or anything. He wants you to learn to be a son and a daughter so you can be healthy enough to be a good mom, be a good accountant, and be a good hairdresser, and be a good union worker, whatever it is you do, lawyer, whatever. It doesn't matter what you do. But the more secure you are, the better you are at all of it. So at the root is the orphan heart. That it, it, When you can get that fixed, it allows you to do all the things that your dreams are. Without getting that worked on, you sabotage your own future all the time. Do real good, and there you go. Right. You know, I got to start, I can't believe we got to start over again. Yeah, you do. Because yeah, you had sabotage built into you from the fall. So as you walk, that's why your relationship with God is more important than all your work. When you get hooked up and you know you're a son or a daughter, you're not competitive anymore, you're not threatened as much, you're not, you don't have to be anything except God's son or daughter. And so you're so relaxed, people don't know how, how to take you because they don't know anything about it because the whole world's pretty much orphaned. They get competitive. They want to be number one in everything. And you might do real, real good in what you do well, but I wish you could do that one thing your whole life. You could feel real good about yourself. And guess what? Life is a whole lot more than what you was good at. You've got to do a whole bunch of things you're not good at. I, I'm, I tell my wife, I said, I have really learned, don't you laugh at me, I've really learned to do what I hate. I can hate something and make myself do it. I don't, I don't like it, and I get grumpy while I'm doing it, but I can make myself do it. Make myself do it. It's not much fun, but that's what it takes. You have to do what you've got to do to make it work. You never get to do what you like all the time. You know, uh, there are things I was really good at that I thought that I closed up and had to go do something that I had to go learn at 49 years old. And uh, that was a stretch. That was a stretch because everybody else had been doing it all their lives and they all seemed to be real good at it. And I had to go learn what I didn't know about being a, a pastor or a preacher or whatever it is that I do. But God used all that to help me do it but it was an extremely hard learning curve. And I think that's where God's talking about today is, is that spirit, that your orphan spirit, God wants you to become sons and daughters. So, um, as a matter of fact, John 14, 15 through 21, but the main verse is 18 that we're going to look at. He knew he was dealing with abandoned people. He said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Now, we'll go ahead uh, back up to 15, if you don't mind, Adam, please. If you love me, 
keep my commandments. Isn't that interesting that he equates your obedience with your love for him? So that would mean that when you disobey, he don't think you love him enough. Because that's the other side of the coin. Remember, there's two sides. We'll keep going. 16 on. And, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. In other words, I've got you covered. You're not going to be by yourself. I'm going to give you the Holy Ghost. We'll keep going. And the Spirit of the truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. That's why trying to talk to people about the Holy Ghost is just, you know, if they don't believe in it, it's unbelievable. They think you're a cult leader. You think you've got a demon. And Jesus said, if I by the finger of God cast out devils, by whom do your kids cast them out? In other words, you don't even cast out devils. And you're telling me I got a, a devil, but you can't do what I do. Anyway, so the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he what? Dwells in you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Okay. He was emphasizing you're not alone. So every time you feel alone, you could say this. Everybody say this with me. He that sent me is with me. I'm never alone. Say that when you feel that way. He that sent me is with me, and I am never alone. Always remember that, because you're not alone. And, and I think leadership is extremely lonely. And you can feel alone, but you're still not alone. Now we're going to go to, uh, oh, we're going to go to 14, 27 through 31. We've got to go a little further. This is the model, okay? This is the model. 14, 27. Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. Okay, so this stuff he's going to give you has nothing to do with the world. It has to come that something that he gives you supernaturally from the inside out. And I will tell you specifically, you need it more now than you ever have because everybody knows everything about everything. If you don't believe me, you can get all the information off of every digital platform you want if you want to, but you still don't know God's voice by doing that. You've got to hear it for yourself. You've got to hear it for you. I didn't say they were right or wrong. I'm telling you, you've got to know God's voice for yourself to have the peace that he's talking about. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. A lot of times they create anxiety, and when you listen to that and you get anxiety, you know there's something wrong with either the way you're hearing it or how they're saying it, and either one of them is no good for you, so just clean it off. Whether it's you or them, it don't matter. If you're going to get all stressed out and driven, there's a problem with what you're listening to, whether it's your perception or their words. Now, he's trying to tell them what he's got to do, and he's, giving, he's going to give them the ultimate priority as a Christian right here. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, see, that's the difference between love. Love would have preferred Jesus do what he was sent to the earth to do. He said, if you love me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father. In other words, be happy for me about something. Quit looking at me like you're the only one and always needing. Isn't that interesting? Jesus was asking somebody to think about him. Rejoice because I said I'm going to my Father, for my Father is greater than I. I'm going to somebody bigger than me. You have heard me, and now I have told you before it comes. He's preempting. Now, my wife would tell you that when her dad was going to go, three years he gave her to get ready. Three big ones. Three big ones he dealt with her weekly or daily or whatever so she could prepare for her father's leaving because she needed three years. Everybody's different, people. Interesting, isn't it? But that's what he did. He did just what he said there. I've told you before it comes. When it does come to pass, you may believe. Now, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and has nothing in me. But listen to this. But that the world may know, he's showing you his priority right here. That I love the Father as the Father gave me commandments, so I do. In other words, I'm going to obey God whether you understand it or not. You will have to remember what I said. Because he is greater than this. Arise and let us go from here. Is that all I said was 31? Yeah, okay. 
He is modeling. He's saying, I want you to see that no matter what we got, my Father is greater, and that is my priority. Interesting. Your kids got to know, Dad, that God is your priority. Wives, mamas, you got to have your kids understand that when God's working through Dad, what he says is the priority. If you undermine him, you're literally undermining the kingdom of God. There's a, there's a protocol in, in which things work. He's saying, this is the priority. I must do what he says. Exodus 21 through 12, 21 through 23. Okay, this is an example of what I'm talking about. Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, pick, now, now he has instructions. But this is their deliverance. You realize their whole deliverance depends on these couple sentences. He said to them, he called the elders. There are elders that actually have authority and are in positions to oversee. Okay? That means there really is a pecking authority in order in the church. You don't have to listen to it, but it is there. Okay? You can't change it. Jesus said, the Father's greater than me. There's always somebody greater than you until you get to the last one. Okay? We're not the last one. He's the last one. He has final say. Even Jesus subjected himself to his dad. He said, my father is greater than I. Isn't it interesting? Jesus was one of the, part of the Trinity, the Godhead, part of the Godhead, but he still wasn't final say. He still was subject. So if Jesus was subject to his dad, how can we not be subject to somebody? I mean, he's Jesus. He didn't, he's God's son, and he still had to do it. Then, he, then if you remember, when he got hollered out at the temple, his mom and dad said, why'd you do this to us? They were ticked. They lost God. <laughs> they lost Jesus somewhere, okay? And he said, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? They didn't care. And it says he was subject to them from then on. He never did that again. Might have been Jesus, but he had to keep the law, didn't he? Obey your mother and your father. See, if he'd have broke that commandment, he'd have been a sinner. So to be a sinless lamb before going to the cross, he had to have no sin. He said, I, I won't do that anymore. He became subject to them. He obeyed them from there. He even made wine when he wasn't supposed to. Wasn't time yet. Mama said, make it, do what he says. She did it. <laughs> do what he says. He says, you know it's not my time, but okay, I'll do it. He wasn't responsible for that because he was in what? The pecking order. Isn't that interesting? That's how important it is to obey. See, you always think you're obeying people. Uh huh. That's what we do, right? What about him? You know, you know, you get like that. Everybody does. It's human nature, but it's not. If you understand the protocol, it's got nothing to do with where it come from. It has to do with the alignment. Alignment is what works, not not feelings. Feelings really don't matter. Okay. So anyway, we're going to keep going here. He gives them an instruction. Pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families. In other words, take it proportionally so there's enough for everybody. So the elders had responsibility. Could you imagine flaking out and not going home and telling anybody in your family die? That's how important this one was. This one was important. I believe the days we're headed for are that important as well, to be quite honest with you. I think this is a prophetic part of this sermon according to your families, and kill the Passover lamb, okay? And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood in the basin and strike the lentil on the two doorposts and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out of the house. Do you realize how specific these instructions are? In other words, kill the lamb, get the, get the blood in a basin, put the uh, hyssop in it, and touch your doorpost, and then don't go outside. They had to do all three things. They had to listen to somebody else, okay? Then the somebody else who did it had to kill the lamb, put the blood in a basin, and was responsible for putting it over the door and telling everybody to stay inside. They all had, there were action steps of obedience. The blood in the basin would have delivered nobody. It had to be applied. The blood had to be applied. 
The blood of Jesus has to be applied to your life. You're not going to, it's, you're not, you don't have an exemption. If you want deliverance, the blood has to be applied for safety. Sobering, isn't it? I thought it was when I was writing it and reading it. It's very convicting to me, too. I mean, words will convict you. It don't matter if you're the leader or not. You know. So the elder that they had to listen to, of elders and overseer, this is a responsibility if you want to get a measuring ruler out to what you think an elder is. I'm just going to give you Peter's version. This is just one. It's verse 2. It says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight. That means there is oversight connected to an elder. Okay? Elders are supposed to have oversight, and elders are supposed to be mature people. Okay? Taking oversight thereof, not by constraint. In other words, you don't, listen to me. That don't work. Not, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, not for money. You don't do this job for money. But of a ready mind. That's, that's the, that means there needs to, you have to have somebody like that in your life somewhere. Because that's just how it works. You think, I always say the same thing. God told Adam, Adam told Eve. That's, you know, God told Moses, Moses told the elders, and the elders told the people. If there's a nor, isn't it funny how God would commit so many precious things to that many translations, though? I wondered about it. Because, you, you know, when you listen to people talk, the stories change. I forget who it was. I think Pastor Rena read this years ago. They, they, in the military, they told this guy one thing. By the time it got down here, it was totally something else. You know, you'd think he'd, but he did write the Bible now, so we're good. <laughs> We can check out what's said with the word, which you, which you always should. So stay in the house until morning. Verse 23, for the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come to you, to your house, to smite you. Isn't it interesting, when God's going to do something, you have to make the difference so he don't do it to you. What I thought was really interesting, he did it with the ark. He put him in the ark and then God closed the door. When God wants to deliver people from evil, he shuts them in and closes the door. Mm -hmm.